So good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for joining us. And this is the third and final event of a series of three web events that are marking the release of eight reports on the topic of North American climate policy. I'm Brendan Boyd. I'm Assistant Professor of Political Science at McEwen University uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I'll be moderating today's event um, on the topic of US Canada public opinion and urban climate governance. So these events are a product of the 2020-2021 North American Colloquium on Climate Policy. The North American Colloquium is a collaborative venture between the University of Ford School of Public Policy, uh, particularly its International Policy Center. Uh, it also involves the University of Toronto and the Autonomous National University of Mexico. So it was established in 2018 and it brings together leading academics and analysts, as well as practitioners from Mexico, Canada, and the United States to address key public policy issues that are face all three countries. And this year, of course, the issue was climate change. So these events and reports uh, on the topic of North American climate policy have also enjoyed uh, generous support from the Meany Family Foundation. And so today we're going to talk about two uh, different papers. First off, we have uh, a paper by Eric LaChapelle and Christopher Bork, which is called A Decade of Comparative Climate in American Public, or sorry, Canadian and American Public Opinion on Climate Change. And then we also have City Powers and the Governance of Urban GHG Emissions in the US and Canada, which is a paper by Sarah Hughes from the University of Michigan. So just, I'm going to take, I guess what we're going to do today is I'll, uh, introduce, I'll sort of um, talk really briefly, very, very briefly about the, the papers quickly, and then we'll quickly turn it over to um, the authors to talk about their papers. Then after that, I will provide a few questions um, to the authors, and then we'll finish up with some questions from the audience. So first of all, I think in terms of the La Chapelle and Borix paper, I think it's really important because it gets us past some of the broad sort of caricatures or stereotypes that we have about you know, public opinion uh, in Canada and the US, right? It starts to dig into that. And the takeaway for me is that, although there's a lot of evidence there that you know, could appear frustrating to advocates or other people that are looking at pushing climate policy, what we see is that there is some convergence around public opinion, although that hasn't translated into policy yet, um, that really speaks to the importance of collaboration amongst the two countries and also really speaks to the importance of this initiative uh, around North American climate policy. Um, in terms of um, the second paper, I think it really highlights the importance of multi-level or polycentric governments, governance. And you know, we kind of consistently need to fight that pull to focus on the national spotlight where the debates are big and, and large and you know, um, can kind of sort of push out some of the more local um, action that's going on on climate change. And I think the main takeaway that I got from this is that what we're really looking for here when we look at municipal governance is smart practices rather than best practices, because there's not gonna be necessarily one best practice, but we can learn potentially from um, what some municipalities have done. So with that brief introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and Chris to provide some comments and reflection on their paper. They will then be followed by uh, Sarah's. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for that introduction, Brendan. Um, first, I wanna thank Josh and Barry and everyone involved in developing this NAC project. Um, it's been a, a lot of fun to be part of this great group of scholars. And I'm very happy to be here today to present some neat comparative data that this project is a part of. So for over more than a decade uh, or so, um, Chris and I have done extensive cross-border comparative polling across Canada and the United States under the guise of the American and Canadian surveys on energy and the environment. So Chris uh, is located at Muhlenberg College and myself at the Université de Montréal. So these comparative polls have uh, happened at least once every fall and they have taken on a number of different iterations uh, depending on the year and what's going on in climate policy and climate politics. We might focus on carbon pricing uh, we did a, a few uh, deep dives, I guess you could call them, on carbon pricing, looking at the effects of weather, uh, adaptation, for example. 
but each year we always ask uh, a standard set of questions on beliefs and policy support uh, that help us track the state of attitudes uh, in Canada and in the United States with respect to climate change. And so our project is very much in line with the spirit of this North American Colloquium Forum. Um, I'd like to start today uh, maybe by situating at a high level our contribution to this colloquium in the broader context of research on attitudes towards climate and energy issues. Uh, as many of you know, much of the research, so of course not all, on, on public attitudes toward climate change is conducted in the United States. And there's a large growing literature um, uh, exponentially so uh, on US uh, climate attitudes, but also other parts of the world, such as the UK, Australia, advanced countries. Um, and we know from this research that one of the underlying factors that structure attitudes on energy and climate is partisanship. Uh, in line with this research uh, and others, we also find that a defining feature of climate attitudes in Canada and the United States is partisanship. And I think this is important because we're able to kind of see to what extent do the dynamics we see in the United States, uh, to what extent are these found in other uh, areas of the world. Um, and so partisanship is an important feature of Canadian climate attitudes. Um, in fact, uh, what strikes me most about the work uh, Chris and I have done over the past 10 years is just how similar public dynamics are in both countries, or the public opinion dynamics are in both countries. So let's take, for example, climate change beliefs, um, which we, we, we look at in this particular paper. For a long time, uh, we saw that American attitudes were more prone to short-term shifts, while Canadian attitudes were much more consistent over time. So in Canada, you'd have relatively straight levels of, of, of beliefs, and, and in the United States, you kind of see this up and down but there's a general trend, but, but much more volatile in the, in the, in the case of the United States. And, um, but the striking feature looking at the comparative angle is it's, it wasn't uncommon to find the same percentage of Canadians believing in global warming over time um, while the average in the US uh, fluctuated. But, but sorry, what really comes out is the enduring difference between Canadian and American beliefs with respect to climate change. Um, uh, with each poll, we'd see substantively larger proportions of Canadians believing in climate change science relative to Americans. But looking at the data, we found that the average Canadian held views much more in line with the average Democrat. So the real outliers here were Republicans. But at the aggregate level, we would find uh, that a substantial 20 percentage points difference was not uncommon. So in, in Canada, you'd have maybe 80% or 85% of the population that believes climate change is happening. And that would be you know, about 20 percentage points lower in the United States. And that was kind of a consistent feature over time. On the flip side, if we look at climate change denial or skepticism, we similarly found large differences. As you might expect, Americans, particularly Republicans, were much more likely to outright deny that the average temperature on Earth is warming. Nearly half of Republicans held this view at the beginning of the decade, not so long ago. Today, Republicans' views have shifted quite a bit in an interesting way, with fewer denying the existence of climate change and more of them viewing climate change as something that's real, but a natural phenomenon. So uh, Republicans in the United States are less in denial about the existence of a warming planet than they are of human activity as the primary cause. And this is an important shift, I would argue, in the politics of climate change in the United States. And we try and flesh that about, out a little bit, at least in the paper, and happy to discuss that in the Q&A. In Canada, we have a similar dynamic, but with important nuances. As in the United States, we also find that right-leaning voters are more likely to deny the, the existence of climate change, as well as its anthropogenic origins. But in Canada, contrary to what we saw in the United States or what we see in the United States, conservative attitudes have changed very little. No less than a third of right-leaning voters in Canada deny the existence of climate change, while one in five believe it's a natural phenomenon and this has remained consistent over the entire decade. The last example I, I'll speak to uh, before handing things over is the carbon tax. Now, the carbon tax is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, first, because it represents a major policy difference between Canada and the United States. As, as you probably already know, uh, Canada has had a federal uh, carbon tax policy 
in place since 2019. Uh, while it's been very, very difficult to uh, institute carbon taxes in the United States. Second, uh, an another reason why the carbon tax example is so interesting, it's, it's also an area in which public opinion arguably plays a, a, a greater role in explaining this difference between Canada and the United States. Now, I'm not going to argue that public opinion is the primary determining factor, but I would argue that public opinion is a major constraint on policy in general and on a carbon tax policy in particular. Uh, and, and especially because uh, as policies are more salient, public opinion becomes more salient, and this is the case of the carbon tax. So we can point to several examples in the United States where public opinion has played a determining role in, um, in, 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 in killing carbon tax proposals, such as a, a, a few in, in Washington state. Whereas in Canada, public opinion was, was played a pretty important role in, in, in the durability of uh, the federal carbon tax by allowing the uh, Trudeau Liberals to uh, continue um, governing the country uh, following uh, two elections. Um, two thirds of the Canadian electorate voted for a political party that supports a carbon tax. So the dynamics are, are pretty interesting there. Um, uh, but before, um, Handing things over to Chris, I maybe want to shift to the implications of uh, some of the uh, some of the patterns I've sketched out. Um, one of Canada's two largest political parties, the Conservative Party of Canada, needs to appeal to mainstream voters if it wants to win an election. The problem is that the vast majority of mainstream voters in Canada are on side with basic climate change science. They see climate change as a problem. Uh, they believe temperatures are warming, they want governments to come up with credible solutions, and as climate change becomes more salient, as it has in, in the past few elections in Canada, this has hurt the Conservative Party, or any party that denies climate change for that matter, or, or has a hard time uh, proposing credible solutions. So the question for uh, Conservative parties across the country becomes, how do they appeal to mainstream voters while not alienating their base? And that's something I think is, is a crucial uh, question for conservative parties in this country moving forward. Uh, with that, I'll hand things over to Chris. Great, Great. thank you so much, uh, Eric. And uh, I'll join you in thanking uh, Josh and Barry and everybody um, that's involved with the project. It really is was an amazing opportunity for us. As, as, as Eric mentioned, uh, we've been at this now uh, for a decade. Uh, and it really was a great time to kind of take stock, if you will, about what we've done over that decade and, and these broad takeaways on comparative U.S. And, and Canadian beliefs, acceptance, policy preferences, saliency on the issue. Uh, so I was very happy to, to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to, to be engaged uh, with the project. And as, as Eric said, you know, over the decade, we've seen some, some shifts uh, in attitudes and acceptance, largely both Canadians and Americans uh, compared to a decade ago uh, are more accepting of the, the problem, more reporting that they're experiencing the problem, more acknowledging the, the nature of the, of the, the issue and its, um, and its, its impact. Uh, the changes in the U.S., as, as Eric noted, um, over this last decade, when we started this, um, you know, Barry and I actually were you know, started a U.S. version of this a few years before uh, we, we aligned with Eric. Um, and we had seen some major shifts uh, over a three-year period where there was a 20% drop in acceptance in climate change in the U.S. Uh, by the time we were starting uh, this project with, uh, with Eric. And in some ways, we I think the divide that we saw at that point was the, the high water point in division and beliefs uh, between Canadians and Americans. And so that's narrowed a little bit, but as uh, Eric noted a number of those things remain consistent um, in terms of the differences with Canadians largely being more acceptance. So, so you might look and, and think, okay, have we have we entered a new stage as we took this on in 2020 with acceptance in both countries being higher, uh, belief um, in the problem, uh, experiencing the problem, which a lot of our uh, surveys have, have shown. Um, and of course, the the juxtaposition of beliefs and acceptance with marginal progress, not, not inconsequential, but marginal progress in things like mitigation, it starts to raise the questions of, of divergence between opinion and policy. Does, does, does opinion lead? 
uh, does it matter? Does it shift uh, the, the efforts in these two countries? And, it, and it's a big question. And, and one of the things, there's a couple of factors that I think our, our paper and other research calls attention to on the policy front. Um, and that's, you know, the, the underlying uh, um, acceptance of anthropogenic factors. As, 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 as Eric noted, uh, you know, we have a, a, a large majority. In fact, in our latest poll, three quarters of Americans say they're solid evidence of climate change. Significant group within that, um, that, that uh, cohort says that it's either uh, completely a natural cycle uh, or that it's, it's a combination. Um, those groups are strikingly different with those that believe it's anthropogenic at its sources. Um, if you think it's um, a you know a natural cycle, which a, a significant portion does, um, your policy preferences, your concern levels, um, the issue saliency are very different uh, than those. And those divides, I think, are are, are worthy of, of consistent um, focus in in our, in this study and and others. Um, and one of the major factors, I believe, and Eric has uh, uh, you know shared. And, and perhaps why we don't see um, more movement in terms of the policy front. The other uh, uh, part of the puzzle is Eric uh, noted issue saliency and saliency has increased, but relative saliency of climate in both of our uh, studies, uh, the US and the Canadian version remain lags behind other issues. Um, and if, when people ask me why isn't policy and, 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 and opinion aligning more on this issue, uh, I'll go to saliency time and time again uh, as the lead uh, in that. We tested in the 2020 elections in Canada uh, or in the U.S. and Canada, the, the last uh, federal elections, how this issue plays. Um, and certainly significant portions of the electorate identified in both countries the issue as important. Uh, and salient, but relative to other issues we tested again, it lagged. This mirrors lots of other studies uh, that we've seen. You know, the US Pew has done a um, number of these placing climate uh, in, a, in a, uh, a laggard position, if you will. And I think that still remains uh, one of the driving factors in, in why we might not see more convergence with policy preferences and actual policy in both uh, countries. Yet the last thing I'll, I'll say is you know, I, we're kind of at this interesting um, point, and Eric and I are kind of our next stage of where we're, we're leaving this, is to look a little bit at at at, um, at maybe where the public turns as we can we continue to struggle in both countries to achieve uh, really consequential uh, mitigation that might align with the the the, the science on this issue just to really slow um, the growth of, of climate change to a, a manageable level, where does the public turn? Do they turn um, to a greater focus on adaptation? Do they turn uh, to the possibility of geoengineered um, approaches to dealing with the, with the problem? In our last few iterations of our, of our project, we're starting to explore those, those possibilities and where a public that accepts the issue, is concerned about the issue, uh, is met with with policy struggles. I think you know the moment we're in in the U.S. right now, uh, this spring, in terms of climate policy and the Biden agenda, uh, is another example of of perhaps the the public's beliefs and acceptance on the issue, you know, meeting with uh, a, a policy uh, situation that doesn't doesn't deliver. So. Plenty of, of more to come. We'll, we hope to uh, share that. We're going to be in, uh, in Montreal. As, uh, Eric noted uh, before, we're in, uh, at APSA in this fall, and we'll hope, hopefully have some updated versions on this. But we were really excited to be able to put a lot of this into, uh, into form and share in this project. So, so thanks so much. OK, thank you both uh, for that presentation. Um, and so just before I turn it over to Sarah, I will mention for the audience that if you have questions, uh, what you can do is put them in the chat and then I will choose. I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. I've got some of my own as well that I'll, I'll do first, but then we'll try to quickly get to audience questions and I'll try to do my best to get as many uh, read and, and to the presenters as possible. But before we do that, let's turn it over to Sarah to give some comments on her paper on on urban climate governance. 
Great. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to Josh and Barry for me as well for uh, the invitation to participate in this effort. It really has been a fantastic experience. Um, and I was realizing it's it's been a little over a year too, I think. So um, it, it's just been great. And uh, I'll say thank you as well to Heather and Brendan for their comments on uh, the first version of this paper too, which were very helpful. Um, so the paper is about urban climate mitigation policy and governance, um, looking at the city level. Um, and the, the sort of background for the paper, it's based on research I've been doing related to urban climate governance broadly, but also specifically some uh, field work I had done in New York, Los Angeles, and Toronto that was the basis for um, a book project. And this paper then was a really nice opportunity, opportunity to think more explicitly about um, how specifically the authority and jurisdiction of city governments in a comparative context um, shapes the successes that cities can or do or should have in meeting their greenhouse gas emissions goals. So this has been an ongoing interest of mine is, you know, what does it look like to actually implement some of the goals we have for our cities? And so it was a, a nice opportunity to think really explicitly about that um, comparative institutional piece. Um, so let me say a little bit about why we should care about cities and climate change or sort of position cities within this conversation a little bit. Um, there's a couple of reasons I often use to motivate this. And one is that cities are responsible for a big chunk of our of global fossil fuel emissions. So they're uh, a, a key source of emissions. Nearly 75% of global fossil fuel emissions um, globally come from cities. And a lot of this is driven by emissions from large wealthy cities like the ones we have, uh, well, many of the ones that we have in the US and Canada. So uh, especially um, North American, US and Canadian cities have large carbon footprints relative to other parts of the world. And so in a way then it means we're not, to a certain extent, you know, addressing these emissions and the kind of urban origins of these emissions are is necessary to meet our broader goals for climate change. Um, and the second motivation then too is that um, you know Chris was asking where does the public turn? One place they turn is to their local governments um, to see if they might have some better success there and they often do. Um, and as a result, cities and North American cities again in particular have been, something of policy leaders um, at the global and regional levels in terms of you know setting greenhouse gas emissions targets, um, making plans, making efforts to reduce uh, greenhouse gas greenhouse gas emissions in that way. And US and Canadian cities in particular have been the real leaders since the 90s even in um, adopting you know Kyoto targets, adopting Paris targets and things like this. So, um, there is policy leadership happening, and at this point, um, well, so I should say, so that leadership has has played out in a couple of ways. I mean, on one hand, we have a whole host of individual city plans, hundreds if not thousands of cities that have plans in place to reduce their emissions, and it's also led to this formation of different types of city coalitions and transnational networks of cities and things like this. Um, and another, so some of their, some of their policy leadership has also come from that collective voice as well. Um, and a third piece I'll highlight is that, um, a lot of cities now at this point too, are working to incorporate and emphasize social justice in their climate planning with many cities, including the three that I'm, uh, focusing on in the paper, rebranding their climate, uh, planning and under the Green New Deal um, type language and, and framing. Um, so at this point, the, the sort of entry point for this then 
is we have these plans. Cities are important. Um, there's there are there's a lot of policy activity happening, um, but you know what do these plans all add up to in a way? Uh, we have, like I said, hundreds if not thousands of individual commitments and targets that cities have in place. But what does it mean to really implement these and have have you know real um, meaningful reductions in emissions as a result? And in a lot of ways, there, there's a lot of different uh, pieces of evidence that point to an implementation gap in cities. So I won't go through all the details of that, but that that's that's a part of the narrative is that we have these plans, they're beautiful, the graphic design is getting really sophisticated, <laughs> um, but that there's the most common result when you start to really unpack some of it is that implementation has been slow, implementation lagged behind where we would like it. Um, and so that's 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 a big question in, in the larger book project as well. Um, but what I highlight in this paper then is that um, one of the key reasons I think that implementation is so challenging for cities is because of the complex sets of and over complex and overlapping uh, sets of jurisdiction that that are in place surrounding urban sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And so cities are not operating, local governments aren't operating with a complete jurisdiction over their emission sources. And that creates some unique obstacles and governance challenges to then moving from you know, having a plan to reduce your emissions 80 by 2050 to actually seeing seeing those 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 goals realized. Um, achieving those kinds of deep reductions in emissions really requires a whole of city approach, right? Deep transformations to urban infrastructures and economies, especially if we're also talking about um, incorporating social justice aims. Um, and so state provincial, federal governments, these, these all play a role in determining what cities, what local governments can and cannot do, what they're incentivized to do, where there's funding available, other types of incentives. And it also shapes the broader political, economic environment that they're operating within and that their potential partners are operating within as well. So the implementation story for cities then is not so straightforward. And I think it also raises questions about how we should be evaluating and um, uh, what's the word I'm searching for? Grading, if you will, um, you know, the, the successes that city governments are, have, are having. Um, so thinking really specifically then in the paper about what role cities do play in the US and Canada, uh, the way I, I kind of unpack this is to, look specifically within the three largest sectors that cities are working within when they're looking to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And that's um, energy production, energy use, and transportation systems. So those three sectors are where most urban greenhouse gas emissions come from and where cities are typically looking to act in order to meet their uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, and so in the paper, I outline some examples of how the role that cities play, city governments play in those three sectors can vary, um, can be highly variable both within and between the US and Canada. So there's no sort of clear answer to what role city governments play in, the ener in energy production in the US. And there's no clear answer to what role they play in energy production in Canada. Um, and so it's just, it's really a mix, but when it comes to actually understanding, you know, the implementation and governance process, that's what we have to be um, unpacking. So I give some examples of, you know, municipally owned energy utilities, provincially driven um, energy generation schemes, uh, privatization or municipalization efforts in the U.S. I also talk about uh, the variation in terms of how cities can govern energy demand through things like uh, municipal building codes, where um, in some cases, particularly in the US cities can play a large role, it can set really aggressive and um, kind of climate oriented uh, building codes that can make a big difference for energy demand. Uh, that's not often the case 
in Canada. They have to find other ways to incentivize energy efficiency retrofits besides um, the building codes. Um, and then in, in terms of the transportation sector, one of the big uh, pieces or one of the big um, changes cities would often like to see is expanding public transportation opportunities, getting people out of cars and this kind of thing. Um, but here too, jurisdiction gets particularly complicated in both countries, in part because of the need for large capital investments for a lot of these big projects. You know, if it's a new, uh, a new light rail line, new subways, even bus rapid transit, a lot of these take a lot of upfront costs um, to put in place. So even if a city has a lot of control over their transit system, that's different than having the capital necessary to um, you know, make a big change. Um, so making sense of all this or kind of taking some, so some key points away from, from the comparison then, I try to highlight a few things. And one is like Brendan was hinting at in the intro is that um, there isn't going to be a one size fits all either within or between the countries. Different policy strategies will work differently in different contexts. And I think that what I really try to emphasize is that um, there should be more emphasis on learning about governance strategies, partnership building, leveraging resources, um, how to kind of get the movement of, or how to get the um, machinery of urban governance moving toward a project rather than, you know, how to, um, write the perfect uh, municipal building code because that might not be relevant everywhere. Um, for that reason, I think too, this collaboration is gonna be really critical at the, at the urban scale. Um, and the last point I'll highlight too is also going back to some of what Brenda was saying is that um, while cities are playing a leadership role in some ways uh, on climate policy, um, and taking some steps to try to, you know, move things forward. Um, state, provincial, national governments are going to be really key. I think in a lot of places, that's the lever we're kind of waiting for to help scale things up, to help, um, you know, kind of take things to the next level in a lot of places. And so, um, you know, the role of cities will vary in 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 different sectors and from place to place but uh, we know that supportive state and national policies are are consistently found to to really underpin effective urban climate mitigation efforts so that kind of um that sort of vertical collaboration i guess as well is going to be quite important thank you very much all right thank you um <clears throat> So yeah, as you can see, lots of great, um, lots of great content here that we can dig into. I guess what I'll do is I will ask a, one question of my own um, to each of the um, of the presenters, and then we'll sort of turn it over to see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, so my first question is for uh, for Eric and Christopher, um, and and Sarah actually mentioned the the Green New Deal. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering if this has signaled in the US, particularly amongst maybe Democrats and the Democratic Party, a move away from market-based instruments to instruments that you know, have a greater role for government or greater government involvement as opposed to market-based instruments. And so I guess I'm interested in your sense of whether the support for carbon tax, we've always thought of it as you know, the sort of uh, conserve, you know, the movement of conservatives to become more and more accepting over time and that kind of, you know, people on the left side were already there. But is it possible we might see a degradation or a reduction in the support for the carbon tax? Or did you come across any evidence of this uh, from people that are now thinking we need to do what some would consider more or would, you know, have a larger involvement for government in terms of the policy instrument selection? I think that's a great question. Chris, did you want to go? I, I have things to say, but if you wanted to go first, give the go U.S. Ahead. perspective or... Uh, go ahead. You could lead, Eric. Yeah, well, I mean, I think your, your, your questions in particularly, I, I think, points to like the Green New Deal discussions were much more prominent in the United States. Uh, in Canada was uh, the Green um, 
forget how it was framed in French, uh, la relance verte, um, uh, right? the, the green uh, recovery, I guess, from COVID. So I think one, one of the things COVID did, and it, it's done a lot of, the, the pandemic has had a lot of um, implications, uh, political ramifications, is I think it's shifted the baseline uh, in terms of, you know, uh, I think there's the public appetite for more government policy has, has changed, right? Or the public acceptability of, of, of government role uh, has, has increased. It's always been larger in Canada. That's something we've actually been able to track in some of our surveys going back in the earlier surveys, um, we looked at you know whose who, whose responsibility uh, should climate change be: federal government, provincial government, municipal governments. And in Canada, it's like all of the above and way higher than whatever you're going to find in, in the United States. So there's always been a larger appetite in Canada for for government intervention. But I do think that uh, the carbon tax um, is is uh, especially with the increases. Um, well, the increase it, it increased in April. Um, the cost of living concerns are very much on the rise in Canada. I can, uh, there's some recent polling I've done that really shows that. And I think market-based instruments to the extent that they, they work through putting a price uh, through the price signal towards consumers and working on the demand side, um, they're going to be facing uh, uh, maybe a bit stiffer opposition than they, than they you know, they've always been controversial. Uh, they raise very important um, distributional uh, justice questions um, in terms of you know who, who they affect more uh, and whatnot, and so I think that you're absolutely right to 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 to, to pose that question. I think it's it's really interesting to see uh, you know we're we're going back to discussions we've actually had uh, a few years ago when we were when market based instruments were still up for debate. It's as if in the last few years it's they're taken as a given, uh, but initially they were much more uh, controversial, uh, and we looked at the relative. Um, uh, popularity, I guess you could call it, of market-based instruments versus uh, government regulations and government regulations tended to be more popular until you put a price tag on them, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, government regulations have always been more popular. That and I think this increased appetite for, um, or this increased acceptance of government playing a role in addressing these broad collective action problems and these broad crises could open the door for uh, more more government type regulations and 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 less uh, market based instruments. But I'm curious to see what Chris has to say. Yeah, uh, I, it was great uh, response, um, uh, Eric and and Brendan. I love the question, and um, you know, I'm, as you could tell by all all the gray in my beard, I, I've been around for a long time, and it's interesting to see the kind of the evolution of these market-based policies in terms of public acceptance right you know back when they emerged they were often hailed as as, as more conservative um avenues to dealing with with problems right by putting prices on on L, on aspects of you know externalities through cap and trade or carbon taxes or other other means like that um, and we've really seen we, we picked this up you know a lot of our polling work right at the end of 2008, uh, 2009, when those issues were being put into to policy attempts in the U.S. and, and to a degree, you know, in, in, in Canada, uh, and the reframing of those uh, as 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 these government intrusions uh, through things like not cap and trade, but cap and tax, right? And um, and so we, we really have seen a persistent um, and strong um, divide, ideological partisan divide on market-based instruments that were once hailed as conservative options, right, to, to do this. They've always remained unpopular. Um, and I haven't, uh, and Eric maybe could add on this, we haven't seen a, a gigantic shift in that. We have seen kind of, you know, rise and fall of, you know, support uh, among uh, individuals ideologically for various various options. The, um, the, the conservatives, I think Eric is, is right. We've actually seen support <laughs> some of those more regulatory means uh, comparative to some of the market-based options, um, uh, you know, as, as you start putting, you know, regulatory means on there and, and um, uh, those types of policies to, to increase uh, energy efficiency. So it is a fascinating um, kind of development that's been permeated our work over the last, you know, 15 years. Yeah, thanks, Chad. That's really really interesting. I think obviously measuring public opinion and how it shifts around the instruments is, is really 
fascinating and how it connects to the, you know, to actual saliency and awareness of climate change is really interesting. So yeah, so uh, Eric and, and, and Christopher both kind of touched on um, the idea of inflation and whether that's going to have an impact on, on carbon pricing. So, and I actually was thinking about in the, this in the context of Sarah's paper as well. So my question for Sarah is, you know, your paper talked about coalition building and framing as being, uh, you know, really important. And I found that to be like really interesting and valuable. And what I was thinking was, given the importance of inflation concerns, do you see this as something that could really increase support for things like energy efficiency programs? And then how would we structure those programs and communicate them to address those concerns and try to, as opposed to being a roadblock, uh, an opportunity to say, look, you know, we can do more efficiency in, you know, in buildings and in other other things as well. But uh, based on, you know, people's like Eric mentioned, people's real concern about inflation, particularly in Canada. I'm not as sure about the debate in the U.S., but I assume it's important there as well. Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that um, I think that when when energy efficient the, the the sort of successful energy efficiency programs I've seen, and I'm thinking about Toronto in particular, actually, um, they're they're typically framed as money saving programs rather than you know a climate program or this kind of thing. Like I always, this is one of my favorite examples, but I mean, in Toronto, Rob Ford signed an energy uh, efficiency rebate program as a kind of, you know, get government off the gravy train kind of kind of program. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's a good point. I think that will help that, that kind of narrative or, you know, help just be more motivation toward that idea that energy efficiency helps, you know, kind of ease the pain, um, you know, takes the burden off and that kind of thing. I wonder, I'm just speculating, I, I still also hear things, uh, we just had this um, sustainability uh, ambassadors training in Ann Arbor that I was part of, and you still people, you still hear people concerned about the upfront costs. And so I still wonder about that, you know, the getting the upfront cost to buy the new water heater or the, you know, the window replacement. Um, I think people, I still get the sense people want government to play a role in that. You know, you want us to do X, Y, Z, um, you know, help help me make it happen kind of thing. Um, but maybe, maybe this helps meet in the middle a little bit more, you know, or it, it you know, helps at the margins kind of thing, at least. Right, yeah, that example of of of, uh, of Doug Ford really stood out to me in your paper too, as well. Right, as a <laughs> not something that, yeah, not something that you would expect to see, but you do have you know conservative politicians in Canada at least going around the country trying to make just inflation and and to try tie inflation to Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government. They're trying to make that happen. So you know, I think that really politicians seem to and Eric maybe confirm this is that that's a big. It's a big issue um, on people's minds right now, and hopefully it doesn't become a detraction to climate action as opposed you know, hopefully it becomes an opportunity. Sure. Yeah, right. Um, so let's move to some of the audience questions. The first one I have is for David Bernstein. And I so I guess I didn't ask if you could put maybe who this is for as well. I think I can probably tell who it's for um, or, or if it's for both people, that would help as well. But I think you know, I'll open it up, obviously, for anybody to any of the presenters to comment on it. So the first one from David Bernstein is, is there a partisan divide in CO2 emissions per capita in the US or elsewhere? You know, I I'll, I'll think I'll jump in and if I, I get it right, you know, obviously, if you look at at states, you know, as kind of the unit of analysis, I, you know, I, I'm sure we could do this with uh, with urban areas too, right? You you see some 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 significant differences, right, across um, states in the U.S. And I'm Eric, you could jump in on the on the provincial aspect of this. You know, if you measure it on a per capita basis, the, I think the answer is yes, right? We see considerable differences. Uh, across is not a perfect kind of linear relationship between you know states and per capita uh, emissions, but certainly I think there's a there's a relationship. Eric, is that, is that 
true for Canada? Yeah, I mean, so we've never, it's an interesting angle, I think. Uh, we never really uh, explicitly looked at it in that way, but I mean, there's, there's clearly uh, uh, some relationship between the greenhouse gas intensity of the province somebody lives in and the average level of uh, belief in climate science, for instance. And so, you know, um, it's not true for all of Alberta and it's important to make those distinctions, right? There are differences uh, within provinces, um, but at, a, at the aggregate level, uh, places like uh, Alberta, which have a high per capita emissions in Saskatchewan as well, are, are very different uh, in terms of public attitudes towards climate change than somewhere like Quebec, which has the lowest per capita emissions in the country. If I'm reading the question correctly, then yes, there's, there's that kind of a correlation. We also, in a recent paper um, with some colleagues in, at UBC and at the University of California, California Santa Barbara, um, this was raised by one of the reviewers in the paper. And, and so we were looking at the extent to which um, conservatives versus liberals, uh, loosely like small L liberals, small C conservatives in Canada, um, uh, to what extent are they exposed to the carbon tax, like their cost exposure? And to what extent might that be a reason why they oppose carbon taxes? And we actually found no difference in the cost exposure between, uh, between the two. But that's at the individual level, not at the aggregate level. I'll say one thing. I'm. I, this isn't. I know it wasn't for me, but I, I feel like there's a there's a pretty good evidence that um, emissions are tied to income, and uh, I wonder if you know, kind of what what drives what, because um, there's also maybe income and and partisan relationships. But that's 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 been some of the strongest patterns I've seen in terms of explaining the spatial variation of emissions. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm out here in Alberta and uh, yeah, it's interesting. We get people that will make the argument that of course we don't, you know, consume all of the emissions per capita. So there's a difference between like personal emissions and then the, just the per capita of dividing, you know, the number of people by the emissions. But I'm not. I'm not trying to uh, to mm -hmm. let Alberta off the hook in any in any respect at all. Um, so let's. I have another question here. Um, this one is to Sarah. It said, "Great." This is from Purity, and it said to Sarah, "Great paper there." I'm just wondering if clients climate science contestation is also influ influencing the urgency of climate change mitigation action in cities. That's a great, it's a great question. And um, so what I've seen is that I think there is some evidence that the partisan um, affiliations such that they exist of, of local government leaders do, does have an influence on the types of policies and the ambitions that the city has um, related to climate change. But I think that the I don't think we typically see the same kind of, of animosity and um, partisan kind of driven debate around climate change at the local level. And I think it's because a lot of the time we're talking about an energy efficiency program or a new subway line or um, uh, solar power and this kind of thing. And I think, I don't, I don't imagine that it doesn't come into play at all, but um, I think it does look different at the, at the local level for that reason. So even some of the climate ambitions cities have, they might call the plan itself um, a sustainability plan or a resilience plan or a community of the future plan <laughs> or something like this. Um, so I, I think it just, I think it does play out a little bit different in term, differently in terms of the actual um, you know, kind of public debate and the public conversation. But like I said, there is some dim dimension where uh, some element of the, the ideology of elected decision makers that, that has also been showed to, to play a role too. I will Thanks. say there, the, 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 other, the, the, the other place I think to look for this or to think about it, I remember uh, Barry bringing this up last year, too is um, when 
the sort of city versus state kind of dynamic too. So I think that that's where another place where partisan um, differences on climate change can play out and affect what the city does, but but still kind of in a different way <laughs> in an intergovernmental dynamic. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, so the next question I'm going to read, because I actually had this as one of my questions as well. This is from uh, Pam Jordan, and she says, um, Chris and Eric, do you have recent Canada-US public opinion data for specific regions, such as the Great Lakes and the Northeast? And I was interested in this as well. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, <laughs> we do. Um, we, you know, we, we code our um, data, our responses by a number of geographic indicators, including state um, and uh, zip codes or postal codes, um, depending on where, where you live. And so you're able to, um, to do those uh, segmentations uh, across. And we've done a lot of that uh, over the years. You know, sometimes we're, we're limited by sample size. Um, for particular regions. So if we wanted to look just, for example, at Great Lake states or zip codes of people within a certain distance from the, the lakes, um, you might have, have modest uh, samples to, uh, to play with. But uh, one of the cool things you can do is, is pool them over time for some, some longitudinal questions that we ask. And so we've, we've done that in a number of, of projects. I think Eric, um, Obviously, you've done a, a, this in, in, with the Canadian data uh, in, in, in certain things. You want to say anything about that? Yeah. Um, so um, we, we, we downscaled the Canadian data, and you can look that up on uh, www.umontreal.ca backslash climat, not climate, but climat in French, so climate without the E. Um, but also there was that was there was that Great Lakes project, Chris, that you worked on with Chris Gore as well. That kind of rang a bell. I don't know if um, if that might be relevant uh, for for Pam. Yeah, Pam, you could uh, reach out to me, and then some folks here, uh, Barry, uh, Deborah, uh, is, is here. Folks that worked on that uh, that project. We did some polling, particularly on the on the Great Lakes region of both the U.S. and uh, and Canada, uh, and it might be, if you haven't seen it, um, we can make sure that you get your hands on that. One last thing to kind of dovetail with what Eric said, we've, over the years, the NSEE, we've um, stored our data and made it available through I, uh, IPCSR at the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we're a couple of waves, waves behind uh, catching up um, with getting it all clean, but there's lots of it there, uh, and you could break it out. Um, I think uh, we don't have zip codes on that because of some um, confidentiality uh, uh, concerns, but you definitely have them by state. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, I'll do maybe one more audience question and then I'll kind of um, also, if any questions have jumped out at the presenters, um, if from the chat, if you look in there, if there's anything that I didn't get to that you want to, to answer, we could, you could also, you know, speak to that as well. But I think there's one from Ben Leffel here that I think is interesting. And this is actually for both, for all three of the speakers. So the question is, does public opinion matter for urban climate action? And so the context here is that um, um, Ben and co-authors found that in the U.S. county level proportion of population, that believe climate change is a threat is associated strongly with corporate facility level GHG reductions. And so belief is also strongly associated with the adoption of climate action planning at the city level, and they have a strong direct effect on GHG reductions. And so I guess this would be for everybody in terms of the statistics, but then also Sarah, in terms of your research and, and looking at the big cities, whether that played a role as well. Yeah, no, I think um, just like um, Ben said, yeah, that um, we public opinion or uh, all kinds of different measures, right? Belief in climate change, uh, partisan leanings, 
those those kinds of measures of public opinion definitely have been consistently found to be associated with the likelihood of a city adopting a climate plan, um, this kind of thing. And I think it gets back to kind of what we were saying before, that I think in some ways local governments are an outlet for <laughs> people's uh, desires to see action, take action on climate change. And it's also in a lot of ways a level that makes sense, right? There's things that cities can legitimately do um, and that they need to do in order to, to meet some of these goals too. So um, that's definitely the case. I think that um, it's interesting to think about sort of where where and how it, it matters, you know, beyond, let's say, predicting, you know, adopting a plan or, um, or some of these uh, emissions reductions, sort of where where it fits in. And I think when I think about some of the implementation challenges, a lot of times it is kind of mobilizing resources and you know um, getting the the money flowing, getting a line item in the city's budget, you know, getting the staff in place and that kind of thing. I think that is a, a an area where public opinion would really help a city as well. I remember can't remember if this is in there or not, but um, again, an example from Toronto, there was a moment when the city was considering um, cutting its uh, its program, its climate program, and people, I remember people showed up at City Hall and stayed until like three in the morning. You know, people really rallied. Um, and, and I don't imagine that was the only um, deciding factor, but the city did end up keeping it. You know, so I think it's not, it, it certainly matters. Um, I think that um, like in most policy, other things matter too, you know, especially when it comes to getting, you know, a big chunk of money from the state or getting uh, the eds and meds on board or um, this kind of thing, but I think it does play a big role. Eric or Christopher, did you want to, to add that from your sort of, um, your yeah. perspective of your data? Yeah, I think we're, 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 we're a bit short on time. I, I think it's a fascinating question. I, I do think that um, public opinion matters for uh, urban climate action. Um, I'm, uh, but I really think it raises some fascinating questions. The reasons why raise some fascinating questions about um, the quality of, uh, of representation uh, in a representative democracy. The, the reasons why municipalities, the reasons why it ought to matter more for municipalities, I think raise some really interesting questions of representation. So I think it's a great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add, I think it's a fascinating space that, that Sarah is working in right here with, with looking at this. And obviously from the public opinion perspective, what's, what, what's one frame to think about, right? A lot of urban municipal governments, they don't have the same benefit as national governments, the same for states of deficit spending, uh, or at least, you know, they can do it through bonds and other things, but there's constraints, right? So as, as we kind of move into this space right now, where they're feeling more of the effects of climate change, especially coastal cities, lots of other areas, um, and they have to ad address, um, you know, the, the problem through this, you know, the, the, the frame of options, adaptation, mitigation, right? Those types of, of things. I'm, I'm fascinated to see where public opinion goes, right? You know, you could, of course, you know, through an ideological lens, want to to take on at a local level um, more mitigation policies. But but is does adaptation become prioritized, right, in 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 local urban governance right now, because it's one thing you can control, and you have a limited budget without those options for deficit spending to kind of do it. So there's this really cool place to that Sarah is occupying right now. <laughs> so good stuff. Yeah, totally agree. That's uh, really interesting. And yeah, I mean, the, the connection, the last question really does connect both papers, right, and shows how they uh, can speak to each other in some ways, even though they're focused on, you know, different things and different methodology and everything. So, so uh, I want to thank our presenters for their sharing their expertise and their work with us today and stimulating a really great conversation. I want to thank everybody for attending um, and making this a great session and for your questions. Um, we didn't necessarily get a chance to get to them all, but thank you for putting them out there. Um, and I, you know, I've read them all and they look very interesting. Um, and yes, also thank you to Josh and Barry and their team for organizing all of this um, uh, because it's been really interesting and really valuable work and I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes in the future. So yeah, um, 
think, Josh, is there anything else? I just wanted to thank you, Brendan, um, as I did in the chat, because um, not only did he do a great job moderating, but he's also been part of this project as a reviewer. And uh, uh, also, of course, my thanks to Barry, for whom, without whom I would not be here either. So. <laughs> Take yeah, care. No, I'm happy to be part of it. So thanks, everybody, and have a good day.